how you hear the music. That means it's time for the horse racing show. Hello, everyone. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for tuning in again this week, listening to us on iPad or your Google Play or watching us and listening to us on Facebook or listening to us on what is the other thing we have? YouTube, of course, YouTube. Twitter, this, iTunes. And Twitter and iTunes. Oh, 93.9 Louisville, The Ville. And this is episode 33. It's kind of a laid back time now, just after Labor Day. We don't want to give up on summer just yet. Just yet. And today we're going to talk about, you know, as we, we talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, money is better than ever in horse racing. But yet there's a lot of places, this we saw recently at Saratoga, where they're having trouble coming up with decent sized fields. I mean, it's not uncommon at all the major tracks to see five, six horse, maybe seven horse fields would be considered a really good deal these days if you can get that. And probably because of that, some people are running horses, you know, just to try to get a little piece of the purse, which you can't blame them. I mean, there's some six figure races out there that are drawing small fields, and we talked to. A couple of weeks ago about Chad Brown had the trifecta because he had the only three horses in the race out of all places, Saratoga. Yes, Saratoga just expanded their meet to two months. They're just wrapping that up. The action moves to Belmont, and uh, Saratoga had record handles, and everything was good. So people are still coming out. They're still betting. If you can bet on something, people are going to show up and bet on it for the most part. So that worked out well for them, and uh, they had a successful meet. Today we're going to talk with two uh, prominent owners and breeders about such things as why is all this happening? Uh, is it tougher to get horses out there anymore? The fold crop is less than half it was 30 years ago or so. Uh, we'll talk with Don Little Jr. of Centennial Farm up east around the Boston area. And we'll talk with Arthur Hancock III, a legendary breeder and owner of Stone Farm in Paris, Kentucky. And they'll give their insight uh, just on their careers and their lives and uh, about the uh, buying and selling and breeding horses and uh, really the state of the union sort of in horse racing today because we mentioned money and who knows more about it than our researcher mr thomas kenny as he pulled in today in his ferrari and i uh, wish <laughs> but thomas you have done some research and the money is out there i mean some races are ridiculously and and good for them but it's uh, just ridiculous the amount of money out there right now it's like all these nba draft choices are getting guaranteed contracts that's right. A lot of guaranteed money, like you said, out there for a lot of the big races. Earlier this month, we heard the announcement of the Saudi Cup in Saudi Arabia with a $20 million purse. That is $10 million for the winning horse. That'll put you right up on the money list, won't it? Oh, yeah. That'll That's, make the whole investment worth it. That, that'll make in the trip over swoop. there. And I think they're going to bring them over there, too. So it's not like you're going to pay for a lot. They're going to bring the horses over as they do in Dubai. Mm -hmm. So if you're a big-time trainer, you got a big-time horse, they're going to take care of getting you there. Unlike if you're here, you know, you got to, your owner is going to pay to fly the horse to Belmont or to Santa Anita or wherever, Keeneland or wherever they're going to be racing. But uh, 20 million bucks, that's like real money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And I'd love to have a piece of that pie. Yeah, and that's just, well, you know, I remember seven figures used to be, wow, seven-figure race. Now, now it's an eight-figure race. And there's more. But wait, there's more. Scott Hall and Ben Chaffins, there's more. That's right. What, what more? Well, so we're talking the Pegasus World Cup next. Yeah. It was pretty much since its inception in 2017, as always touted as the world's most expensive horse race. Yeah. Right? Right. That was kind of the whole point of the deal. Yeah. Uh, it's a nine furlong race, so you know nothing too extreme. Yeah, average. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the prize pot is sixteen million in twenty eighteen, which has now gone down, I believe. Yes, sixteen million. Just, yeah, 16 just 16 million. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Please, so if everyone would send in a dollar right now, we could help raise the purse for the Pegasus. <laughs> so now what they've done for 2019 and beyond is they've split it into two races, right? Yeah. They have their dirt race and then a turf invitational. Right. So the pot split basically between those two so races. So you got about two $8 million races. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. That's still $4 million for a win. Just paltry stuff these days. <laughs> And then there's the Dubai World Cup. Mm -hmm. 
which the I think is still cup. up there in the top three or four. I it's guess. number three. Yeah. Number three, yeah. Because that was the richest forever mm -hmm. until Pegasus came along. Yep. It's been around since 1996. And in 2019, the winner is going to take home $7.2 out of a $12 million purse. Wow. That's good. That's pretty good. Yeah. I'll bet that they outdo the Saudis within the next year. It might turn into an arms race. It, it, will, it will be. Yeah. It will be. And now the purse is $30 million. <laughs> that is just unheard of money. It reminds me of, I remember when Keeneland, who has the richest thoroughbred auction, and they don't have it anymore, the July sale. They've moved it all to September, but they used to have these two days in July that, you know, crazy money was spent. That's, uh, there's a $13 million horse, a $10 million horse sold. I remember being there for that. I remember being there when Fusaichi Pegasus sold for four million, uh, but it got to the point at Keeneland where they only had six figures on their tote board. So when they first started, you know, knocking out all these million dollar horses, probably oh, I guess 83, 82, 83, 84, right and through there, where they just had a slew of them. I mean, it's nothing to have 20, 20, 25 horses sell over two days for a million bucks. So I remember they had to add that other digit. They had to make it seven figures. You don't remember that, do you, Scott? I, I don't. Yeah. So now it's gotten that way with horse racing. That's not a bad problem to have if you're no. running out of numbers on your tote board. No, you know, <laughs> you get 5% of what's going through the ring, you know, so you're selling a hundred, few hundred million dollars worth of horses. You can add one more digit. You can buy a new clock. Oh yeah. You can buy a new tote board and put up there. And that's what they did. Wow. So we've got those. Gee, what, what is like four and five? What are they worth? Like only two or three million dollars? Well, number four is actually an Australian race. It's called the Everest, uh -huh. raced on turf. Uh, looking at a winning a winning horse, a winning bid in that race is putting you at four and a half million. Yeah. Number five is actually the Breeders' Cup Classic. The Classic, yeah, it's still hanging in there. That was the big deal. Remember the Breeders' Cup Classic? That was the race, That's right. and it still is, obviously, in so many ways. But the money. Uh, what does it pay now? What does it pay? About out? six million dollar pot. Yeah, six million dollars. That's not too bad. Winner gets sixty percent. Mm -hmm. You can live on that. Oh yeah, not bad. And hello to our friends in Australia, by the way. One of these seventeen countries that have downloaded this horse racing show. I've never been there. It's beautiful. I've heard. I've seen the travelogues. I've met several people from Australia. Everybody's nice. I've never met. I'd never met Olivia Newton John or Mel Gibson or the Bee Gees, but. I've met some other people from Australia, and they were all very nice. And I would like to go down there to the to the cup someday or, and just see that. That'd be a road trip for us, Scott. It'd be a heck of a road trip. Yeah, we got to get some more sponsors. We'll jump right on that. That's right. We're working on that. <laughs> we'll work on that. Okay, so that is why it's called the Sport of Kings, isn't it, Thomas? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't have too many races out there. Any more like a hundred, a two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollar race, and they're still out there. They're still the backbone of the industry. Actually, claiming races are the backbone of the industry. You know, you go and look at a car, you got claiming races out there. Uh, you know, that's what keeps it going. Races that are still five figure races out there. But uh, it is fun, and just like all other sports, people get excited about how much money is at stake. You know, what I got friends who get excited about a player's contract. I go, okay. Hey, do you hear what he's going to make? He's going to make $40 million this year. Okay, good for him. <laughs> Ain't that something? Yeah, it really is. And how does it affect me? In no way, but good for them. We will never have a horse. In a, the horse racing show will never have a horse in a $10 or $20 million race. Yeah, chances are slim. Yeah, it's chances <laughs> are slim. We'll ante up and see what we can come up with. Here's what we're coming up with next. Don Little Jr. will join us next from Centennial Farm. They're coming off a big win in the Woodward Stakes over the weekend. And later on, Arthur Hancock III. It's all here on episode. What episode are we on, boys? 33. 33? How about that? Moving right along on the Horse Racing Show. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. This is episode number 33. Thank you for tuning in to YouTube and watching us or listening to us on iTunes and Google Play and uh, downloading us now in 17 countries. You know, one of the great things about this show is catching up with some friends who are doing well and uh, get their story a little bit and find out more about 
them because they've made major contributions to horse racing. One of those is Centennial Farm. It was started by Mr. Donald Little back in 1982. Uh, it is a very well-known and respected racing, breeding, and racing partnership organization. His son, Don Little Jr., has been in charge and is coming off a big win with preservationists in the Grade 1 Woodward Stakes over the weekend and many horses they've had success with over the years, uh, including uh, Colonial Affair, Wicked Strong, Lil's Lad, I'm going to miss somebody, Ruby King Kugat, and it goes on and on. Basically, 140 graded stakes they've won or placed at Centennial Farms. And joining us now is Don Little Jr. Don, welcome into the show. Great to be here, King, and always a pleasure. Congratulations. That was a nice win for preservationists over the weekend. I would say it was probably one of the gutsiest, if not the gutsiest, performances of a horse um, I've ever seen, especially in person. I and uh, I've seen some comments on Twitter and Facebook um, that, you know, it could very well be considered the race of the year if it comes down to it. Yeah, I think I think right now it is the race of the year at this moment, uh, you know. Who knows what's ahead? Maybe the Jockey right. Club Gold. Uh, maybe in the Jockey Club Gold Cup, there'll be another big race for him. Well, that would be that would be nice. Uh, of course, you you mentioned Colonial Affair, and he was victorious in that race. And uh, let's see, nineteen ninety four. And uh, I actually was visiting my mother this morning and catching up on some things since I've been away from Saratoga. And sure enough, that trophy is sitting on the mantelpiece uh. in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect that's the perfect so it was, spot it was it was it gave his little <laughs> bit of a uh, motivation but you know that's all up to jimmy and and his crew and uh because they've done a phenomenal job yeah trainer jimmy jerkins uh you know we talk about uh family business of course his father alan the legendary trainer himself and, and you're you know you're carrying on the family business that your dad started with uh, centennial farms and people probably said hey who are these boston guys i'm talking about like 1982 <laughs> i don't know maybe they said 82 you boston guys you're not in kentucky you're not in maryland you're not down know. here in this horse racing country what's going on with you new englanders well i think you know that's very true because as you well know that the old Kentucky hard boot network was a little bit, uh, you know, tough to sort of break into, but especially being from New England. But, uh, you know, a lot of it goes back to, you know, our roots. And, you know, my grandmother rode steeplechase horses way back when, and dad had his first racehorse when he was 16. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at this and the people involved with us now, and the even back of the people that uh, when dad started, a lot of it had to do with our polo connections. Um, right. you know, dad played polo when he was younger. He was president of the United States Polo Association. And I was playing, uh, I played professionally for many years. Many other family members are still competing. But, uh, you know, when dad started, he knew Will Farish. He knew, you know, Alan Jerkins played polo. So Dr. Carr, who selects all these great horses for us, was playing polo in Aiken, South Carolina. And uh, so that's sort of where, you know, where, where it all began. And, uh, you know, I was just, I happened to be on another uh, show this morning with Steve Vick. And one thing that I mentioned that you mentioned how we carry it on from our father's tradition, both Jimmy and I, it is you know, a lot of family businesses aren't fortunate to have that happen. Um, some of them blow up. There's difference of opinions. And it's kind of a neat thing to say that, that we're, we're carrying it on and um, quite successfully, I would say. Oh, I, in, indeed. And, you know, I remember, I remember Colonial Affair, I don't. This is not the first time I heard of Centennial Farms, but you know, obviously, you win a, you know, you win one of the Triple Crown races. Uh, people know automatically. I mean, mm -hmm. they they learn quickly, at least. I'll say who who you are, what you're about, and all that. I don't know if that was if there was one moment or turning point for the for Centennial Farms or not, Don. Well, I mean, I think that was that was one of the major turning points that started to you know where we are now because prior to that, and you know. Dad being in the investment business, the whole goal when we started Centennial, or he started Centennial, is that you know, Centennial was more of an investment vehicle than anything. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a way to uh, incorporate his love for, for horse racing uh, into that 
that realm because limited partnerships back in the 80s was one of the most attractive investment vehicles in the for tax purposes. Right. And, you know, they didn't, people didn't really care what the underlying asset was at the time. So dad saw an opportunity. So, well, I'm going to take some of my Wall Street buddies. Uh, form a, we actually formed a broker dealer uh, called the Centennial Group and, you know, sold it as licensed securities. And we had people at one point, I think we at one point had over 600 clients rubiano's partnership which was a limited partnership back then had 65 people in it and uh most of rubiano was just one cult out of a group of five and the other ones are all phillies and so we all mostly were phillies to help the uh keep the residual value and then when the tax laws changed you know a good timing on my part that's when i got involved Tax laws changed in '86, and I got involved in '87. That was really good <laughs> timing. <laughs> timing the key, isn't it? <laughs> it was. It was awesome. I said, "Well, there's only way to go up from here," and uh, you know, I really wanted to do it. And my father said, "Are you sure?" Because it's very difficult. And um, you know, we kind of had a meeting with Dad and Dr. Carr, and you know, how are we going to keep the train rolling? And you know, I said, "What do people want? They want to win a, the big." big races. They want to win a triple crown race. They want a classic race and he, nothing against Phillies, but you know, they want to hit the home run and let's market it that way. And Colonial Affair was the first general partnership with Colts that we did. And we went to horse people saying, we know you like the business, take a little bit of your horse budget and participate with us. And that's how it started in the, with the Colts. And it involved, you know, evolved into what it is today. And really, that's what we focus on, buying well-bred colts that have a pedigree if they're successful. Uh, you know, a stallion station in Kentucky will want to stand them. And, and uh, you know, over the last 29 years, uh, we've campaigned a stakes horse in every year except for six. Mm-hmm. And in those years, four of those years, we bred a stakes winner indirectly. I mean, right. one of our stallions, you know, that produce stakes winners. Talking with Don. So that's Little, pretty good for buying six horses a year. Don, you're doing pretty well, man. I mean, <laughs> you seem to <laughs> well, be doing pretty well. I mean, you got a horse racing business. Uh, talking with Don Little Jr., the uh, co-owner and president of Centennial Farms. You got a you got a business that's been going since 1982. There's a lot of businesses. Forget horse racing. 1982 till now, a successful business is a pretty tough deal, especially as you mentioned with you know changing uh, tax. Uh, uh, structures, et cetera, like that for the horse racing business. I mean, that is quite an yeah. accomplishment. Yeah, but it's been fun. I mean, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with everybody that's involved. Dr. Carr, Paula Parsons, who runs the farm in Virginia, Jimmy, um, you know, the, the true horse people, that's what, this is what we do. And, and this is what we enjoy. And this is our life. And it's, and we do what it takes to work together and make it all, uh, all happen. And, you know, the partners, you know, silent partners that they may be are very key, and and we do our best to make it fun and enjoyable, and uh, you know, to have the longevity in in the business. It's but you know, it's in your blood, and and all the people that get involved with us on the partner side, they're educated from the beginning, and they can see the love and the passion of this business that we all have, and. Uh, you know, it was in the family, and and uh, you know, my my, as you well know, my aunt Patricia Mosley and her, right. her her husband Jim, Uncle Jim, who passed away some time ago. They had Arbo Stables and mm-hmm. Top Cider, and you know, a very good you know friend, my family member, and cousin Adam Snow, who's a professional player. You've worked with him numerous times, and you can tell by him his passion for horses, and you know, it's in our blood. And uh, you know, it's interesting is that you you made your you made your mark with the Colts with Colonial Affair, who was ridden yeah. by a, who was ridden by the only female to ever win a Triple Crown race, Julie Crone. Yeah, she's she's uh, she's quite something. Um, you know, we still t- stay in touch. We had our twenty fifth Belmont uh, reunion anniversary last year. She was at Belmont, and we had dinner a big dinner at the Garden City Hotel. And of course, she was 
bopping around <laughs> Belmont Park on Belmont Day, you know, she's real easy to keep under control. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alicia, <We've> had, <laughs> we know Julie. Yes, <laughs> she's quite she's quite flamboyant, and uh, you know, she just had a, a jockey school actually in Saratoga this summer. Yeah, um, yeah, she did real well with that. Yeah, and we sponsored one of the jockey the the, children, the kids and. Um, it was a great success, and uh, you know it's it's such a unique business. The, the, the people that you meet and the friendships that you grow and build, and you know I would say that you know we've scaled it down to uh, I think we have something like just around ninety clients or partners, and I can honestly say every one of them are friends of mine, and uh, you know we're like minded. We know the risk. We, we enjoy the times we spend together um, and, and, you know, memories that are created and, you know, the pictures on the walls. It's, it's you know, you can't really explain it until you're involved in it. Right. And, uh, you know, it's a way to become involved. I would say we're a little bit more exclusive than others. Our price point's a little higher, but you're talking to me. I mean, the people, you know, I have one assistant, Julie mm-hmm. Tatone, who's been in the business not, she's been with Centennial for 16 years, but her husband had some wars with Suffolk, and you know she worked for the HBPA at Massachusetts here while Suffolk and Rockingham was in full swing, and so it's been it's a neat neat uh, business to be involved in. Is racing partnerships now talking with Don Little Jr. of Centennial Farms because you guys were on the cutting edge. Your dad, when he started Centennial back in 1982. I mean, there weren't a lot of partnerships. It was still a lot of farms, a lot of individuals that were the powerhouse players. Uh, that's changed dramatically. Uh, we actually had Wayne Lucas on the show several weeks ago, and he said that's the biggest change that he's noticed since he's been training is racing partnerships now. Uh, has, has really changed the game where it's not just that one guy or one farm that can control the situation of having the best horses. No, I mean, it has changed. And, you know, again, it goes back to the, it's an expensive, you know, sport, uh, especially to participate at the high end. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, expenses are are continuing to rise. Uh, You know, so it's it's a lot easier to handle and, and deal with and defeat, if you will, with some friends. And, you know, the neat thing about it is, Last year was the first year they did it at the racing museum in Saratoga. They had a night called Syndicate Night, and there were eight different partnership groups there. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty small in terms of attendance, but the people there were qualified, I would say. Uh Um, And it was unique because every person that attended was able to go to each partnership group and chat, and every person that came to our... um, table or booth it was interesting that their response was you know every single partnership group here that we've spoken to is different right so i mean it, you know it's it's like anything in life you, you know you you do your due diligence you do your research you talk to the people involved because this is something that you know if you're going to participate you kind of want to know the principles of the company and how it's working and they said everybody's different the price, price points are different some are one horse some are multiple horses you know, the, the, you know, some are claiming partnerships. Um, you know, now they have these uh, fan groups that, you know, you can get in right. for $100. And, you know, I mean, that that's great for racing because you never know where the next person that's going to be an owner is going to come from. And uh, so you just got to be out there and visible. And, uh, you know, there's many opportunities to get involved in this sport. In, through partnerships at all different levels and price points. Don, you know, one thing that is I'm curious about now is uh, the racing, the money out there is better than it's ever been. And, you know, we've got yeah. some of these, ex, ex, like the Saudi race is going to be coming up and the Pegasus and, of course, still Dubai. And, uh, you know, million-dollar races are not uncommon now. I remember when it first started, you know, 30-some mm-hmm. years ago as a big deal. Now you expect that. However, the foal crop is less than half of what it was 30 years ago. And there are some places, and we talked about this earlier in the show, you know, like Chad Brown winning the trifecta with his three horses, <laughs> the only ones in it at Saratoga. I mean, I'm just yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, it would seem to be at a premium right now to even get a horse to to the racetrack. I, I don't know why there are fewer horses being bred and running uh, when there's more money at stake. Well, I think, you know, and, I, and I'd said earlier this morning on the other show that this was, you know, I believe from what I've experienced over the years that the horse market and the horse business itself is very healthy right now. Um, you know, you hear complaints. I was in a meeting with the president and I, David O'Rourke, and a group of um, uh, people in the Saratoga community from real estate to restaurant tours to uh, automobile dealers and owners and trainers at the beginning of the Saratoga season, which was kind of neat. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that was brought up was, you know, size of fields and difficult of racing races to be filled and the full crop. And I, I honestly believe, Kenny, that's, you know, it, it's like anything in economics, supply and demand. The, the, I mean, what, when you put on a, whatever product it is, it's got to be a quality product. Mm-hmm. And, you know, racing, it, it's, I felt there was too many races and cutting back in terms of number of days and focusing on better quality. Um, you know, I think that's, you can do that now because there's a lot of retirement programs that are for racehorses now than there ever have been. So, mm-hmm. I don't think, you know, I mean, they're getting quite busy and you don't want to have over, overfill those places that, you know, there are opportunities. But, of course, that means the price point of buying these horses is going to be higher. But that's good for everybody. Um, I just, I from the way I look at it, my perspective is there's better horses out there and uh, the quality looking at yearlings even is better than it has been over the years in terms of physical makeup of the horses. So if somebody calls, yeah, I I was going to say, so if somebody calls Don Little Jr. at Centennial Farms and says, I want to get into your partnership, what what should they kind of be expecting to to at least, you know, to open the door and get into it, Don? Well, I mean, you know, our price points, I would say the minimum on, on an individual horse, we do two types of partnerships. We do individual horses twice a year. Um, and then we do a large partnership, um, which is coming up for the Keeneland sale. We'll buy four or five. But the individual horses, like the horse we bought at Saratoga, it's a candy ride colt that we paid a half a million dollars for. Mm-hmm. And the minimum in that one was $40,000. Yeah. Typically, the one horse partnership will be 25000 Right. But that's good. And, and the way they're set up is. is that's a one-time investment, hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, because it covers all expenses through the horse's two-year-old year. Hopefully, they'll be, you know, make a start or two. If they don't, people are responsible for their own pro rate of mm-hmm. share of the expenses going forward. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you know what you got after your middle of your three-year-old year, what you're dealing with, whether or not it's worth continuing on or not. Right. Um, because we've been in existence for as long as we have in relations and connections and uh, reputation that we've created, aside from all of the thoroughbred aftercare programs, we've been able to create our own internal basic aftercare program. Um, you know, most of the horses that end their racing career, we can place pretty easily. Right. Um which is a nice thing to to have in our in our closet, if you will. Let's talk about the polo world. Don Little Jr., <laughs> world class polo player that you were. Yeah. And uh, and you talked about your cousin Adam Snow, who's just one of the great guys I've ever worked with. And we do the uh, yeah. you know we do the U.S. Open every year. And Adam's been so welcoming to me. Uh, I've en- I've enjoyed my polo experiences and. Uh, you know, they, they, it started out, NBC put me on polo because I cover horse racing. They, so they figure right. a horse is a horse is a horse, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, But but it's been fun, and, and I really in, enjoy it, and I've learned some of the strategy by listening to Adam. And uh, do, do you ever still get out there and just kind of uh, have some fun with it? Or, or is it still too competitive that you have to, you know, it's, it's like these basketball players. i got friends that used to play in the NBA. They have trouble. They can't get in a pickup game. You know, the, the juices are still there. Yeah, no, I mean, it is, I mean, first of all, you know, it was a, 
I I started at a young age. Dad played, and you know, it was just there. It was, of course, I got on horses when I was in diapers, and uh, it, it's such a unique sport. Um, you know, I, I I was fortunate enough, athletic enough to be successful, where I was able to play internationally for many years. And I truly believe that helped um, in this business, in the racehorse business, in terms of connections mm-hmm. and um, you know, credibility uh, on the horse side of it. But it's, you know, it, it's an, one of those things where people say, well, why do you quit? I said, well, because I the competitive juices in me, like you said, yeah. um, are there, but with being more involved in the racing game and the traveling and the time that I needed to make Centennial successful, I just couldn't do both. And uh, I have to admit that I'm getting the itch. I mean, yes, I'm almost, (laughs) I'm 58 years old, but it doesn't, it's like anything. It doesn't go away. And back to the retirement of racehorses, one of them, a horse by the name of Securitas, who actually won at Saratoga last year, and had the fastest mile in an eighth up until the Traverse, I think, or I mean up until the Jim Dandy or the Whitney, I forget which one. He's at at home here in Massachusetts, and he's just about sound enough to where we can get on him, and I think I'm going to see if he can uh, handle a mallet swinging around his head and, and see if I can get out there and hit the ball around just to, you know, Get it, get the juices flowing again, just to uh, have a little fun, and you know it never really goes away. And I, of course, I won't be competing in the, the U.S. Open anytime soon. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Adam was able to do that for many years, and uh, he actually was up here in Boston this summer playing, and it was nice to see him back at, at you know at his roots. And I remember when I was younger and. He'll, he's, I'm sure he's told you that he learned a lot from me and uh, when he started and uh, you know his breakthrough was in Saratoga when they were playing polo up there. Yeah, he has and uh, we talked a lot about horse racing and about you know the polo ponies watching them they change the leads and things you know I've kind of learned yeah. it's uh, yeah and, and they're and they're running it incredible. You know, they're running side by, I'm not telling you this, you know that, but, you know, they're running side by side most times, and they're, you know, sprinting down there. And uh, what I like is the change. When you when you guys change horses at the end in a polo match, it's like a hockey. To me, it's like a hockey line. You know, you jump yeah. off one, you jump on another. Yeah, no, it is, they, that, that actually, when, when, I, when I was playing, they didn't used to do that. They used to jump off and hit the ground and then jump back up, but now they just go from one to the next. And, um, you know, the, the thoroughbred, as a as an equine athlete is is the most athletic of any any horse right and um you know the most of the horses you see in polo now there is there is thoroughbred blood in them, most all of them and i mean i had i mentioned my aunt and topside earlier and, you know i actually she actually gave me a two year old one year um my topsider that wasn't going to make it as a racehorse, but he was still a, a stallion. And I trained him, we trained him, I played him, and he got to be quite good. And as a matter of fact, I gave him to my cousin Adam to play in Florida one year, and he actually won Best Playing Pony in one of the tournaments there. And, and I said to Adam, I said, that's it, you can't have him anymore, I'm selling him. <laughs> <laughs> because I got a good offer from a breeder, and, and uh, he became the top polo stallion in the world and still is one of his it's the third generation now stallion um it's it's very influential in polo and it's it's a son of initial son of topsider and uh one of the own reinhardt he was a teammate of adams and when they played in the u.s open um i think six of the eight horses that that owen played that year were by by amber shoes was the name of the colt and uh, so it's it's neat to see as well. And all my best horses were off the racetrack. <laughs> um, so it, it, there is there is a little bit of a connection. And, and most of the partners that I have involved now are have some polo roots. And I think the crossover 
is there because of the speed factor. Yeah. You know, trying to get people from the show world into racing is a little bit more difficult because they don't get it. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the speed factor has a lot to do with it. And preservationists watching him in the stretch run, it looked like a polo match. I mean, he was, he was bumping and driving to get through that hole like, like Adam would, you know, going That's to right. goal for <laughs> overtime. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> no, it, it, there is a little bit of a connection, I'm sure. They put a mallet in Johnny's hand instead of the, instead of the crop, you know. <laughs> yeah, it would have been good. I don't know who would have. Could, but and and it's funny because the jockeys realize know that I played polo, and a lot of right. them sometimes will say, "Well, you know, I got to come out and try that sometime." I mean, I told Jose and I read Ortiz at the Belmont Child Care, which is you know I'm on the board of it, right. and uh, we had to charity dinner the other night last year and i was saying we're well, showing them some pictures of me playing pole and they're like jesus you were doing that <laughs> yeah so but uh so it's all fun oh. it's all fun don it's been great catching up and congratulations on uh preservationist that was a big win yeah. in the woodward a great race for him and maybe we'll see him in the jockey club gold cup maybe well we, you know i mean that it, it, it it's there uh again we're gonna see how he comes out to uh, you know, Jimmy. Jimmy has said in the in in the press that you know we'll definitely look at it, and uh, you know he's really come into his own. And and kudos to Jimmy and Dr. Carr, who's you know selects the horses for us and is our vet there, and you know saw the talent, knew it was there, and you know I have relayed that to the partners, and and they believed in what we had to say, and you know. The, the 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 outlook is much greater today than it was in February. Well, I look forward and to that's that's the beauty of the business. <laughs> that's what keeps us all going, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I look forward to catching up with you again in person. It's always great to see yep. you, and thanks for being on with me today. My pleasure. Maybe I'll see. You. I'm head to uh, Lexington on Friday, so maybe I'll see you there. Yeah, I'll be in Belmont this weekend. I'll be on the NBC oh, show this weekend. Yeah, so but but well, soon. I'll be I'll be there for week anyways so. okay well we'll catch you up here okay all right great all right thank you don little jr centennial farms joining us here more to come on the horse racing show Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Thank you for tuning in again this week, watching us on the YouTube channel, listening to us on iTunes or Google Play, as well as 93.9 The Ville. With me is a longtime friend of mine. He is a legendary breeder and owner, Arthur Hancock III from Stone Farm in Paris, Kentucky, who joins us now. Arthur, glad to have you on the show. How are you? Well, good morning, Kenny. I'm fine. I hope you are. Life is good, and it has been for many years for you and Stone Farm and God Odell Soul, the 82 Derby champ, and Sunday Silence, the Derby and Preakness winner, and the win the Breeders' Cup Classic, uh, two of your better-known horses. But uh, it, it's been a career that you have built and following in your father's legendary footsteps. Uh, did you ever feel pressure along the way, Arthur, to do well in this business? Well, yeah, sort of, you know, uh, in the early days I did, and that's one of the reasons, you know, I decided to strike out and start my own farm and leave Claiborne. Maybe part of that was because of the pressure, but I sort of wanted to see what I could do on my own. And um, But after that, really, no, not really any pressure. I just did the best I could. It's a 24-7 job, and there's a whole lot of... Um, downs with it as well as the ups you know as they say there are a lot of valleys along with the peaks but uh if you like anything else if you enjoy what you're doing you know it's not so much like work so uh it's been a good run and we're we've we've been fortunate to have bred and raised some good horses not only for ourselves but some of our clients you know like this year bricks and mortar for instance I was going to say, uh, a pretty good horse you got there in bricks and mortar. Some think he might be the best running out there right now. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, he was a good-looking yearling, uh, good-looking foal, good-looking yearling, and we sold him at Keeneland, and he's done great, and I'm hoping he'll keep going, maybe be horse of the year if everything goes well. 
as far as, you know, what I've always fascinated about the breeding business and experts, which I consider you one of, and other guys I've talked to, no matter how much you figure this is going to work, uh, there's still, you know, that big question of will it really work? Uh, you know, will this breeding of this, this stallion to this mare, is it going to work? And uh, I find that fascinating always how you put it together to try to figure out what's the best scenario for a breeder. You know what the definition of an expert is, Kenny? <laughs> yeah, I believe I do. <laughs> well, it's a person who knows more and more about less and less <laughs> until he knows absolutely everything about nothing. <laughs> so, I think with the, with, the, with the breeding, you know, you just, uh, as, as the old fella said years ago, you pay your money and takes your chances, and uh, you pick... You know, you based on temperament, speed, size, uh, all those things, and pedigree, Nick. You you take your best shot, and as they say, uh, my dad used to say, "Breed the best of the best, and hope for the best." And it worked well for him, the legendary Bull Hancock of Claiborne Farm, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's worked well for you. I mean, even even like Fusa Icy Pegasus, Risen Star, a couple other outstanding horses that you were part of the breeding process. That, that uh, I guess you consider them your horses, even though they're not you sold them. They're not your horses, but you know it, you've, it was very much a part of Stone Farm and Arthur Hancock. Well, it's kind of like raising a child. Some see them go out and do something. And yeah, they're they're part of the family, really. Even though when you sell them, someone else owns them. You know, you remember the days when they were foaled and they were raised as little fillies or colts and then went out there and, and did something. They, they never leave you. It's part of you and part of your life and part of what you do, you know. And uh, right now, you've not shown any signs of slowing down. As you mentioned, bricks and mortar uh, bred by Stone Farm out there on the track, just, just burning it up. Uh, no signs of slowing down for you, Arthur. You know, I still go seven days a week, and uh, I like what I'm doing, and um, I'm thank God I'm in pretty good health, and so I'm gonna. I'm kind of like Charlie Whittingham. He said I'll be training horses till the day I die, and I guess I'll be living on the farm trying to raise another good horse till the day I'm out of here. And uh, I want to ask you about the way that uh, the industry is now. There's more money than ever before out there. You know, million-dollar races are common, and there's some incredible money with uh, some of these, you know, super races that they're having now putting together. Uh, but yet there's fewer foals out there. The foal crop's half of what it was 30 years ago. And, you know, you do have races at big tracks where you have maybe four or five horse fields that you wouldn't think of uh, in the past. Uh, is, is there a reason that there's fewer horses being bred uh, with the with the money that's out there? Well, you know, I don't think there are as many, you know, owners that like there used to be. You know, you used to have the the Vanderbilts and the Whitneys and all those big breeders in it, and uh, I they're not here anymore. And I, I don't know the answer to that, frankly, really. I, that's the only thing I can come up with. No, that makes sense to me. And, you know, partnerships are, uh, there's so many partnerships out there now, which I think has been one of the huge changes in the sport, uh, that, uh, you know, there's people that can pool money together that don't really have to breed the horse. Uh, they can just buy into the horse. I think that might have a lot to do with it as well. Well, that's right. And like I say, those people used to, They'd have farms, or they'd board their mares with a farm, and uh, so there were, I believe there were more horses being produced when those kind of families were involved in it. And now it's mostly, I think you're right, that they have the partnerships, they have the buyers are out there. The sales are still going pretty good, but um, maybe that has something to do with it. You know, there just aren't as many breeders around as there were. Tom, with Arthur Hancock III, Stone Farm in Paris, Kentucky, of course, uh, carrying on the tradition of his grandfather and his father, and he's won two Kentucky Derbies. He's bred some outstanding horses and continues to do so. And, you know, Sunday Silence, I, I guess, 
you know, if you're identified with one horse, it would be Sunday Silence, wouldn't it, Arthur? And I know what a special horse he was and, and so much fun for me to cover throughout his Triple Crown run onto the Breeders' Cup Classic win. Well, he was a special horse, no question. And, you know, back when we, the crash came back in 88, and if it hadn't been for Sunday Silence, um, I don't know what I doing because we probably would have lost the farm so thank god he came along and uh he always will have a very special place in my heart wow he saved the farm i didn't know that oh yeah we acquired a lot of debt a lot of land and then the bottom fell out right. in 88 you know what was worth a dollar was worth 30 cents and mm -hmm. owed a lot of money and uh there came Sunday silence, and, you know, it was sort of like a miracle to happen. It was really very special. His whole story is special, isn't it? You know, he survives a van wreck, and if you looked at him, you would not say this is the best-looking horse that Arthur Hancock has ever seen, but except when he started running. No, he was a foal. He was... A lot of people thought he was ugly. He didn't sell for anything out there, you know, 17000 I bought him back for the Tom Tatham, who was the guy who owned him, and, and took him the ticket back behind the Keeneland Sales Pavilion and said, I bought him back for you. He went too cheap, and he looked at the ticket and looked at me and said, well, we don't want him because our advisor doesn't like him. And I stuck the ticket in my shirt pocket and said, okay, and then I remember thinking, well, I guess I just blew another 17000 <laughs> <laughs> And that was Sunday silence. So we were very lucky, very fortunate. It all turned out very, very blessed, really. And, uh, you know, I mean, he was, he was so special in so many ways. And, uh, you know, and, then, and with Charlie Whittingham, the legendary trainer, and, and you and Sunday silence, I think for anybody that covered that, and got to be around you guys. That was such a fun Triple Crown run. Winning helped, of course, but, I mean, it was a fun time all the way through. It was a fun time, and uh, maybe that's why we keep working so hard. We're trying to do it again. Do you think about? Do you think that Derby again? I mean, I guess that's what every Kentucky guy. Well, any breeder, you know, I want to win the Derby. When you say that's still the race that most breeders want to to have a part of, that they had a Derby bred horse or they own part of a Derby horse. Well, I think especially if you're a Kentucky, and you know, it's uh, that was what I wanted to do. Is my you know all my life was win the Kentucky Derby, and I remember when I left Claiborne sitting on a porch of this little house I lived in, and I thought, well, maybe by the time I'm 75, if I'm lucky, I'll have a horse in the derby. Maybe I'll get lucky, and and uh, we, we got lucky earlier than that, but um, I'm 76 now, and, and it'd be nice to try to go down there again with one. We had one this year, Roadster, right. who won the Santa Anita Derby, but he he didn't like that mud down there, and uh, it just didn't work out. But that's that happens, you know. It's uh, you got to have everything going your way. You got to be really lucky to to even get there, and then to 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 run a good race. I believe I'm remembering this story well. It was 1982. Godot del Sol way outside in the post position draw. No one had won from outside there, and you being the Vanderbilt University graduate. I believe, did you call someone, I think at Vandy and uh, some kind of engineer, and they figured out the actual course to get to that first turn was not as far as uh, it seemed to be uh, in terms that your horse would be in good shape coming that far outside? Yeah, no, we drew the outside post, and everybody at the draw <laughs> said, oh, gosh, that's such a tough break, and no horse had ever won from the outside gate, and we were real depressed, came back home, and I was just sitting there thinking, what in the world is so bad about being out there? And I had a vague recollection from my Vanderbilt geometry that you could find the distance, uh, you know, something about the hypotenuse of a right-angle triangle, but I didn't remember it. And I called my buddy Paul Sullivan, who's a lawyer here in Lexington, and he they used to call him the math whiz. And so he said, yeah, that's... Uh, he said, how far are you out? How far is the gate from the rail? And I told him we were about 
20 stalls out, about four feet of stall, 80 feet. And he said, how far is it to the turn? Do you know? I said, it's exactly a mile and a quarter. He did some figuring and, um, I forget the formula now, but I think you take the square root of the base plus the height squared, and it gives you the distance of the hypotenuse, which is the distance he had to go from that outside gate, you know, to the turn. And he said, you know how much you lose? And I said, no, probably, what, 10 lengths? I mean, we're, we're cooked. There's no hope. He said, Arthur, you lose 2.4 feet. And I said, what? He said, let me refigure this. So he refigured it and said it's 2.4 feet. And he said, that's all you lose. He said, now, that is assuming you don't come rushing into the rail. You know, stay out there and angle in. So that's what we told Eddie Delahousie, stay out there. I told Eddie, he's from Louisiana. I said, Eddie, just put that horse's ears on the on the turn down there and don't come in like you're plowing a field when you put the muffler of a tractor on a distant tree you can go in a straight line and i said just hang out there and and uh and we won't lose but 2.4 feet and i told eddie gregson about that the trainer and he was astounded he said we probably lose a minimum of five links maybe seven or eight so you know that's what happened and uh, of course we were lucky to have a fast pace in the race but still being out there and staying behind and not losing that ground, we he came flying in the stretch and he won the Kentucky Derby. And I mean, it was like, man, I mean, that was an out of body experience, you know, it was unbelievable. Oh, I remember it. Well, see, look at this. All these years, I remember you telling me this story. I don't know if you remember it when I was doing local news in Lexington and you told me that story before the Kentucky Derby that this is. Yeah. Because I was like you, I thought, geez, you, you're out of it, man. You, you're. I thought it'd be 12 or 14 lengths. I didn't have a clue. It just seemed so far out there. But then again, well, physics and geometry and all were not my specialties, Arthur. Well, I got a D in the course. That's why I didn't remember what it was. <laughs> but, but I did have the vague recollection, and, and uh, you know, Paul was good at it, and and Eddie Gregson, the trainer, you know, he was a very smart guy. He was a Phi Beta Kappa at Stanford. And he told, you know, he said that, he said, well, you're going to lose, we're going to lose a minimum of five links and maybe seven or eight. He said, it's, it, we can't overcome it either way. And that's when I told Eddie Gregson, on, I told him what we had done, what Paul had figured out. And he said, he said, is that right? And, you know, and he, he looked at it and then he said, well, I'm okay. So he called Eddie, Eddie Delahousie right then. And we got excited about it. The horse was 21 to one. He paid $44. Yeah. <laughs> so we all made some pretty good bets on that. And it was a big day. It was a, it was a fun day. And, you know, my life dream had come true. And, um, it was, it was just really something. With Sunday Silence, it was a little different, right? Because you come into the Derby now, you're not a long shot. People knew Sunday Silence, and Charlie Whittingham was kind of rejuvenated, wasn't he? Just three years earlier, he'd won with Ferdinand his first Derby, and uh, you're a Derby veteran now by this stage? Yeah, we uh, well, everybody thought Easy Gore was going to beat Sunday Silence. Yep, most great rivalry. Did. All the Eastern press was for him, and... I remember when Sunday Silence worked down there, he went a half in 46, uh, which is a pretty fast time. And a lot of the, all the reporters said, oh, Mr. Whittingham, he went too fast, didn't he? And Charlie said, no, he went, he did okay. And they said, well, that's awfully fast, Mr. Whittingham. He said, he did fine. We were walking back to the barn and I said, Charlie, what do you, what do you think? And he said, my boy, we will get the money Saturday. I said, Charlie, you really think we can beat Easy Gore? He said, my boy, we will get the money. Well, you never went against Charlie Whittingham, did you? <laughs> when he said no, something. Man. No, he said a good horse will work that fast, no problem. And, uh, you know, later in the year, Sunday Silence worked a mile in 133 out there at Del Mar. He was really a great horse. He was a really good horse. And he beat a great horse in Easy Gore three out of the four times they ran. Yeah, great rivalry. I mean, one of the better rivalries in the last 30 years or more. 
Yeah, I've had people tell me over the years, and I agree that that Preakness was maybe the best race they'd ever seen. Yeah, that'd have to be, and that'd have to be, and I think any of us that saw that and others, that'd have to be in about everybody's top ten for sure of all the races over all the time and Breeders' Cup races and Triple Crowns. That was a tremendous, maybe the best, the best Preakness, most exciting Preakness finish I can remember. Yeah, that's what that's what. Of course, I thought that, and but but so so many people have said that over the years, and uh, but it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. I remember when Gatto was coming up to the Derby, you were the first person to come out the farm, and yeah, you were young, young, and and broadcasting, and we did a, an interview and had a lot of fun. I can still remember when you imitated Count Dracula with that smile of yours, but I, I want you to do it on TV again one of these days. <laughs> I got to. That was our Halloween special. I remember that. <laughs> Which, you know, something else among the many great conversations that Arthur and I have had over the years on camera and off camera, um, I remember you told me a long time ago when I was still learning a lot about the business as uh, – and, you know, friends ask me this today, and I give them this analogy, like they asked me about Justify, why he didn't stay on the track and things like that. I said, Arthur Hancock III told me a long time ago that it's like it's like the song business. If you're a singer, you're going to make some money. You have a hit record. But if you're the guy that writes the song, you're the songwriter, you're going to get those residuals for many years. And that's, uh, I think, still the best analogy of should I keep the horse running on the track or put him in the breeding shed where those residuals are going to go on for years. Well, sure. If you're fortunate enough to get a a good horse that can go to be a stallion, then uh, then that's that's how you pay your bills on the farm. You know, you can. That's one way. And uh, and with Sunday Silence, though, you know the Jap and nobody wanted to breed to him. Yeah. Because they thought he was a freak and a fluke, and we had like three people that would take shares in him, and uh, and only two people that wanted breeding contracts. And my brother Seth told me he already had 50 contracts to easy go down there at Claiborne. And um, the Japanese made us an offer, and with all the debt we had and everything, and nobody interested in breeding, we, we sold him. And uh, I always say we didn't sell him. The American breeders just didn't accept him, didn't want to breed to him. So we had to, you know, no question. And the Sunday Silence influence is, is certainly still being felt. Oh, in Japan, he's yeah. the best thing ever happened over there. Yeah, he made their racing for the most part. Made, made it, made it, put him on the world stage. And uh, they're smart, though. They were smart to buy him. And, you know, he was a great horse, and he made a great, great stay. And, and his sons are doing great at stud, too. Well, I mentioned that songwriting analogy because you're the only – now, I'm not saying there aren't others, but you're the only one I personally know who has uh, – owned and bred Kentucky Derby winners and written songs for Willie Nelson and Ray Price, two legends in the music business, and also have recorded your own album. Yeah, we, uh, we've done a couple of CDs and, uh, my son and I did one, a bluegrass one and uh, Ray cut two songs I wrote. And then uh, he and Willie cut that run that by me one more time. And <laughs> That's a classic. Grandpa Jones, Grandpa Jones did three of them and, did one I'm on hee haw and so uh it's a you know something I've always liked that almost went into it but um uh, I figured if I had a song in me to write I could do it on the farm when I was raising horses and uh, but that's that's been a lot of fun and I've known a lot of great people in the music business and I cherish all those memories writing a song is that tougher than putting together a good breeding well, I don't know. It's writing a good is. song. <laughs> yeah, I would say it is, sure. Well, I've never really written a really good song, but I have bred a pretty good horse and uh, so I I don't know. It's hard to say. It, you know, you you just do you you do your best and hope for the best at whatever you do. And the harder you work at something, the better you get at it, I think. And my work's been in horses and and uh, I've worked at songs, too, because I love that part of it. But uh, it's it's hard to compare it. You're just very fortunate if you get a good good song or a good horse, right? I, I think so. And, uh, and one day, we'll get you to come into our studio here because we have a guitar hanging that people say, 
that, that watch this on YouTube. What's that guitar there? And I said, someday we're going to get somebody in here that actually can play and sing. So one day we'll get you in the studio and we'll, we'll do some, well, I won't do anything. I'll sit here and enjoy it from the album Sunday Silence, which I still have, by the way. I still have the CD. Really? Yeah, well, there's a, you know, I wrote a song about Sunday Silence, yeah. and here comes Sunday Silence again. And um, it's actually Peter Rowan told me last week that he may record that. Peter's a friend of mine. Uh-huh. Uh, actually, when I was at Vandy, he was the lead singer for Bill Monroe, and we got to be friends. We've been friends for over, what, 50 years. And uh, so I hope he does, because he's really good, got a good voice and everything. And actually, Larry Rice, who is, I guess, no kin to you, but he did record Sunday Silence. Right. I'm no kin to Larry or Tony or any musical Rices. Yeah, they're brothers. And yeah. um, Larry passed away, but... Uh, and Tony, of course, a great guitar right. player and a great singer until he lost his voice. But, uh, uh, well, you well, you can imitate Dracula, so I, <laughs> you can do that. I've seen that. Well, <laughs> you, you, you write one of those songs, and I'll pop in and do a quick voiceover, and then I'll step away from the mic and get out of the way of the real musicians. How's that? All right. Well, if I ever get up there, I'll, I'll, I'll do Here Comes Sunday Silence again. Hey, Arthur, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, congratulations, on all the success, I've always appreciated our friendship, and congratulations on Bricks and Mortar as uh, the Stone Farm legacy continues on now. Good grace, what, going into four decades of success on the farm. Well, thank you, Kenny. I've always appreciated you and our friendship, and it's really great to talk to you and keep up all the good things that you're doing. All right, we'll catch up again. Thank you, Arthur Hancock right, III from Stone Farm in Paris, Kentucky and more on the horse racing show when we come back. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show, episode 33. Thank you for being with us on lead guitar as always. Scott Hall on bass has been Chaffins and our researcher, Mr. As he now goes by, Thomas Kenny. And who, who, who is a math whiz himself. So you enjoyed the Arthur Hancock story about uh, figuring out with physics and geometry that that outside post, which was 18, was only two feet basically apart from if you were inside. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous yeah. when you say it out loud. But if you, you know, sit down and think about it for a second, then it really, you know... You're taking basically basically just the most efficient path to the rail, right? That's it. That, that's it's not it, like the quickest path to the rail. You're not getting there. Yeah. You're getting there right when you need to, right when you're going into the turn. That was it. And Eddie Delahousse rode a brilliant race. By the way, Gatto Del Sol in 82 was the first horse to win from an auxiliary gate, which is 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Uh, and at that time, it was impossible. No one had ever done it. And he did it from post 18, which was also the post of American Pharaoh. Uh, since he did it in 82, actually, every post has won a Kentucky Derby except post 17. But like 15, 16, 18, Big Brown won from 20. Uh, so there is something to that. I guess if you have a good horse or the horse is certainly ready for that day, that's all that matters. Yeah. It's not like in motorsport where if you... You're starting from the 20 position, mm -hmm. you know, on a grid. Yeah. You're behind everybody else. Right. And you're going to have to fight your way through the field. But in a horse race, if you're in post 20, you're starting beside everybody else. Yeah. Which makes it not nearly as daunting of a task. Look at you. Very interesting. That was astute. That is true because you're not staggered. You're not going for post. You're not going for the pole. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're all lined up across. Some are just a little farther out, which is obviously not as far as we thought. Mm -hmm. That is our science and math lessons for today. Uh, I would be remiss without mentioning the passing of Randy Romero. Uh, I knew him pretty well. I had a chance to interview him over the years, the Hall of Fame jockey. Uh, truly wonderful gentleman. He had battled illness for a long time, and uh, he will be missed. Uh, you think of some of the great horses he rode, like Go for Wand and Personal Ensign. And his father... Lloyd Romero, uh, you know, this This is the story. I don't know if it's ever been totally proven, but sorry, Lloyd Romero, his father was a trainer, quarter horses, had been a state trooper, started training quarter horses because he'd been in a car crash, and uh, it left him a little 
challenged uh, in in uh, physically challenged. I mean, he still got around, but Lloyd was a trainer, and uh, and then trained later on thoroughbreds as well. But he supposedly is the basis for a story, a movie from 1978, Scott Hall, that you'll put now into your uh, Netflix search called Casey's Shadow. And it's centered around Rio Doso Downs, which has the, the big a million dollar race at that time, quarter horse race. And uh, the trainer is played by uh, Walter Matthau in it. Oh, cool. What's it called again? It's called Casey's Shadow. Okay. It's a pretty interesting movie about horse racing and particularly about this uh, trainer, which supposedly was based on the life of Randy's father, Lloyd Romero. And it's got a good cast. You know, a lot of movies like Murray Hamilton. Who's the mayor in Jaws? Best known for that, he's in it. And Robert Weber and Alexa Smith. You'll recognize the people. They've been around a long time. It's it's a fun movie. And uh, again, just wanted to acknowledge Randy's passing because he was really one of the real good guys. You always enjoyed being around him. And even as he was going through a very tough fight uh, throughout the, probably the last eight ten years of his life, he uh, just kept a very positive attitude and inspirational to many people. All right. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to Don Little Jr., Centennial Farm, Arthur Hancock III uh, from Stone Farm for being with us. If you happen to tune in to NBC this Saturday at 430, I will be at Belmont as part of the crew there, bringing you live racing action on NBC 430 this Saturday. Next week, we'll be back with Episode 34, How Time Flies. Thank you for tuning in this week to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice, and we'll talk again soon. What?